The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the 38th Mogcast, and there has been rather a long break since the 37th. Jacob, the 37th was on November the 5th, bonfire night, a different world. Boris Johnson had no majority. Jeremy Corbyn might become prime minister. The government was battling through and we sit here today, do we not, in a completely different world? We do. And it's very reassuring as somebody who believes in democracy and in the wisdom of the British people that we are where we are. Because if you look back as to what was happening in the autumn of last year, the political system was trying to obstruct what the British people had voted for. And they were trying to obstruct it all ways around, that Jeremy Corbyn didn't want to have a general election, and they tried to stop the government delivering its Brexit policy and the policy voted for in the referendum. And eventually we got through to an election, at which point British voters said, we want what we voted for in the first place, we have confidence in somebody to deliver, and that somebody was Boris Johnson. And so we are in a much better, much happier position. And the nation is so much more at ease with itself. Now, I must, um, talking of being at ease or not at ease, I must tackle one thing directly at the start, which is since then, though quite a while ago now, we had your comment on Grenfell. Do you think the reaction to that was overdone? I was trying to say that with what we now know, nobody would take the fire brigade's advice to remain in a burning building. Um, I am old enough a politician to know that unless one phrases oneself extremely carefully, things can be taken from their context. And that caused an issue. Um, And that's something that happens in political life. Do you feel you got it wrong? I've always thought that politicians saying that I was created out of context means that they must have made a mistake. So you made a mistake? I would be difficult to deny that. And were you hidden away afterwards? And there was a good deal of commentary about this, including I read only this morning somewhere that you were banished to your constituency and how sad it was to see you in a single-breasted suit. So you mean a single-breasted suit? Yes. Well, I do have a single-breasted suit. I'm fascinated that people should pay such attention to to what I wear. I think I was also in a list of um, the worst-dressed men in England uh, during the election campaign. Or worst, or, point. worst or best dressed? You weren't around very much. I was, campaigning my, I was campaigning in my constituency. You weren't kept off camera and off broadcast, as far as you know. Well, I don't think there was any plan for me to be um, on camera and on broadcast, that I don't think I was ever part of the uh, election campaign um, strategy. Let's come straight down to... Um, uh, brass tax. I just wanted to ask you uh, about a story this morning about the coronavirus, uh, and we will talk about that a little more in a moment, uh, I hope, which was that um, as a matter of Brexit policy, we've refused to stay in uh, the EU-wide early warning system um, for the coronavirus. Is that story right, as far as you know? Well, the truth is that we've left the European Union and we leave, therefore, the institutions of the European Union. Uh, We have no say and no vote on any European institution, but we work very closely with our friends in the European Union. I, I think this is a very narrow focus that because there is a committee of the European Union that we're not on anymore does not mean that we're not cooperating with our allies. The two are separate concepts, and we're going to have to get more and more used to this, because the reality of not being in the European Union is that we are not ex officio on these committees, but that there are going to remain many common interests. That's what the Foreign Office is for, to maintain good foreign interests. It's what embassies are for. And so I I think there's too much excitement about this. This is a very good example of what's arguably something of a dilemma, because you're quite right, we come out of the institutions we leave the jurisdiction of the court, we're no longer on the committees. But it will be said, 
shouldn't exceptions apply in what is arguably a huge public health crisis like this? Shouldn't we have observer status at the committees and be able to sit with uh, other ministers in the European area drawing up a common response? Well, I think this is once again raising the status of the European Union. The European Union is one of a number of players in dealing with the outbreak of the coronavirus. The Chinese government is obviously critically involved, uh, the Japanese government, the Korean government, um, the US government. We have to deal with all these people to try and work out how best to control it. It's not a narrow European issue, and we'll be dealing with the EU as we deal with the United States in a friendly and sympathetic way, in a cooperative way. But that doesn't mean we need to um, have representation on US committees or Chinese committees. I'm not sure they'd have us. Um, any more than on European committees. Now, you've just come from a COBRA meeting about all this. It's a very well-advertised meeting. How serious is the problem, in your view? Um, well, I can't discuss, obviously, what was discussed at the COBRA meeting. Um, the government is taking the issue very seriously, is planning for what may happen, is taking the best advice from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific people to ensure that the response is proportionate um, and covers whatever eventuality may come. I mean, as the um, chairman of the Health Sec Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt, former Secretary of State for Health, said, uh, if there were any country in the world that was well prepared for this, it was the United Kingdom. And I think that's, that's very reassuring. The main message at the moment is incredibly simple. And that is wash your hands. And if you want to know how long it should be for you to wash your hands, you have to do it for one verse of the national anthem, at which point you will have killed viruses on your hands and you will reduce the spread. It, and I know you're suggesting singing the national anthem while you're I washing your you hands in order to be able to measure the time. I don't think you need to do it out loud. I think you can do it quietly. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I think um, gentlemen's toilets might get a bit noisy. And um, I've seen somewhere in the papers today a top-end government estimate of 500,000 deaths. Does that figure ring a bell with you? I've seen the same newspaper reports. Um, but whether these newspaper reports are factually accurate or not, I can't tell you. Let's just suppose for a moment um, neither the best nor the worst. In other words, that there's not a high death rate nor a low death rate, however you measure these things. Even so, if there's some sort of median outcome, even a medium to low outcome, there will be an enormous amount of economic disruption, presumably. Is there any lesson for this um, in modern practices regarding supply chains, international trade, and all that? And there are interesting questions about um, supply chains involving China and the reliability of them, and issues uh, around um, just-in-time deliveries, and whether companies will need to think about their strategies for events of this kind. But you've got to contextualize any economic disruption. When we had the global financial crisis in 2008, that was a destruction of capacity, and therefore the bounce back took time because you couldn't put the capacity back on overnight. With something of this kind, it is a delay in demand rather than a destruction of capacity. And the two are very different economic uh, eventualities, aren't they? That You're all... suggesting any bounce back ought to be more rapid. That's right, because you lose nothing in your supply chain other than the connectivity at one point, but that doesn't reduce um, a, a lot of... Uh, Apple telephone components are made in China. If there's any disruption to the supply of components, that doesn't interrupt the demand for iPhones. It just delays the point at which people can get them delivered. And therefore, you move demand uh, from one quarter to another. And that's very different from the type of credit crunch we had when the whole productive capacity of major economies was reduced. It does depend on the um, scale of the damage the coronavirus does in China, doesn't it? Which is a closed system and hard or impossible to read for us. Um, it is very difficult for us to read. There are apparently cases in Wuhan now seem to have peaked. If that's right, that's obviously good news. And uh, 
how, how does government go about striking this balance between complacency and panic, um, which is clearly what you're trying to do here um, in the face of something like this? It's a matter of preparedness, that it's a matter of reassuring people that the government is as prepared as any government can be. Um, and I think that is the reality of the situation. And it is also, I'd go back to hand washing, reminding people there is something they can do. We can all play our part in making the spread of the coronavirus um, less likely. And it is hand washing and it is using Kleenex that if you sneeze or cough, cough into a Kleenex and then throw it in the bin. It, it, it is really simple. I mean, in the Second World War, coughs and sneezes spread diseases keep the germs in your handkerchief, trap the germs in your handkerchief was the slogan. Um, and it's the same message now that they went on to say, keep the country fighting fit. Um, the, the message is exactly the same. You, you want to stop the spread of the disease by doing what you can so that you don't uh, pass any disease on to anybody else. And um, let's discuss something else and find out if it's literally the equivalent of coughs and sneezes or if there's a more profound illness. Uh, have you ever heard Pretty Patel shout at anyone? No. And you don't, for a moment, do you believe claims that she's a bully? No, I think it's absolute nonsense. And I think Pretty Patel's marvellous. She's one of the most effective and capable ministers. I'll give you a little anecdote. But when she was in the DWP, um, I have a constituent who has very serious disabilities. Uh, and had been denied her PIP. And unfortunately, this constituent has had the same mistake happen to her three times. So I've dealt with three different ministers to get this put right. On each occasion, it's been put right. But with Pretty, it was put right within 24 hours of my speaking to her. She acted immediately and she got something done. With other ministers, good and competent people though they were, it always took much longer. So she's active, she's capable. I, I'm such an admirer of hers. And is this, perhaps, what's at the root of what's happened? And, and just to be clear, it is uh, not just a process story, this, is it? It's quite extraordinary to have a permanent secretary suing a department for constructive dismissal. Um, I'm regrettably limited on what I can say because he's now bringing a legal action uh, and um, can't express my views. Beyond saying how fortunate I am to have such a fantastic team of civil servants, I've been, interestingly, you may think I've gone native, but I've been very impressed in the leader of the House of Commons office by the people who support me. And to give another little anecdote, um, uh, when we had to sit on a Saturday, um, my private secretary asked if anybody would volunteer to come in. And every single member of the office volunteered to come in on a Saturday, um, to the extent that some had to be persuaded actually to stay at home rather than come in. And I, I, I think there are fantastic and hardworking, diligent civil servants who absolutely understand the point that they are there to support uh, the minister, whatever party you, the minister comes from. You haven't from. heard of a permanent secretary resigning before then saying he's going to sue the government, have you? Um, I haven't seen one give a, an emotional interview exclusively to the BBC before either, no. And just coming back to what you said about Priti Patel a moment ago, to the speed of getting something done, is it conceivable that what happened here was that um, she wants certain changes in the Home Office done fast? One of them might well be to get the immigration policy done quickly which we know that the government wants to do, and that the um, Permanent Secretary's view was that it couldn't be done as quickly as the Secretary of State was asking. Don't I say, in those circumstances, if what you say is right, it's not for the Permanent Secretary to have a view, it's for the Permanent Secretary to deliver uh, for the Minister. That's the point of civil service. It says that the civil service, the whole concept of civil service having a view is wrong. If the Permanent Secretary thought that it was difficult to do, He's perfectly entitled to say to the minister, this may prove difficult, but I will do my best. It is not for a permanent secretary to say, no, no, I can't do that. That's, that's not he, how our system works. But were the minister to say, and this example is clearly hyperbolic, but there's some point in it, I want the entire staff of the Home Office to assemble at Swindon tomorrow morning at 11am, 
the permanent secretary would surely have to throw his or her hands up in the air and say, Minister, this simply can't be done. Why can't it be done? But actually, the example you give, the permanent secretary sends around an email, he says, I want every member of the Home Office who can to assemble in Swindon. Uh, it's got very good road connection, nice train. Um, Swindon, the gateway to the west, as everyone, they used to ev say. Everyone and, on the train? No exceptions? And you wouldn't get everybody there. But I mean, you'd, you'd make, a, you'd make a pretty punchy effort. You're literally saying the permanent secretary can never say to an elected politician something can't be done because it's impracticable to do it. I think that the civil servant has to try and do what is requested. Now, if the minister were to say, look, I want you to get um, uh, one of my staff on the moon tomorrow, no, that can't be done. And there are some things that are simply and genuinely accepted to be impossible. But within the bounds of policy making, say, I want a policy within a week, it's not unreasonable. Do you think, therefore, since we've explored this example at some length, that um, this hypothesis is right and that there's a policy clash here, a clash about the implementation of policy or even the desirability of policy? I'm sure it's inconceivable that there would have been a clash about the desirability of policy because civil servants have no view on policy. They are there to implement the policies brought forward to them by ministers. And I would be deeply shocked if any permanent secretary were ever to have come to the conclusion that he had a policy difference from a minister. Is it really correct to say civil servants never have a view, a view on policy? I mean, remember Michael Quinlan, who was the great theoretician of multilateral disarmament at the Ministry of Defence, and he precisely did have a policy view, didn't he? I'm just right. plucking just yeah, one. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, well, you've, you've written about this and been very interesting comments. Um, but that's not the job of the civil service. The democratically elected government is there to get its policies through, and the civil service is there to implement it. Um, it's fascinating what uh, Lord Blunkett has been saying about he found in his first six months that there was a, um, his policy, and then there was this thing called home office policy, and the two didn't always match until he insisted so that So you think did. sometimes there is an issue, therefore? Certainly shouldn't be. It's certainly unconstitutional, but uh, um, you're pointing to evidence of the, of, of the other. But that's quite constitutionally wrong. And so are you, by citing Blunkett, you've slipped I'm, into I'm the accepting that this, these shocking things may sometimes happen. I was merely saying it would be more shocking in this particular case, because the former permanent secretary has made it clear that's not the case. I mean, you don't feel... I mean, one of the things um, uh, some of my media colleagues are doing, which um, fills in a certain amount of time, I suppose, is they are painting a picture, and the picture is of Dominic Cummings, not very far from us in Downing Street, tearing up all propriety and convention and constitutional practice and imposing all sorts of monstrosities on the civil service who are the guardians of propriety and order. It is a nonsensical view. First of all, Dominic Cummings is a brilliant individual uh, who gives enormous intellectual heft to this government um, uh, and is a rightly important force with, within this government. Um, secondly, the civil service aren't the guardians of anything. They are there to implement the policy of the elected government as long as that government has a parliamentary majority. Um, it is for parliament to legislate, for the executive to set out policy, and if it can get that policy through parliament, then it's for the civil service to administer. That is propriety. How would you feel if you were Rishi Sunak, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and you opened the Times on Saturday to see Sajid Javid announcing what may well be key elements of your budget? Oh, well, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, you would think that that was a perfectly reasonable thing for the former Chancellor to do, that um, the, the Chancellor uh, is now the Chancellor, it will be his budget, but the former Chancellor is entitled to say things that he was thinking about. That's not unreasonable in either respect. Is it a reasonable thing to do? I mean, the former Chancellor must have been aware that um, he's uh, announcing bits of it in advance and taking the shine off his successor's ball. Not necessarily, because I have no idea what will happen in the budget. Um, so we'll have to wait and see uh, whether any of these suggestions from the former Chancellor come to pass. What do you think about the whole business of merging um, the Treasury in Number 10 at the top? Well, it's merely a restoration of uh, how things came to be in the first place, isn't it? How did Walpole have such power? 
to control the money. Do we really want to go back to Walpole? Um, in some respects, uh, he was a very effective prime minister. I, I certainly don't think we want to go back to the jobbery that existed in the 18th century, but I don't think that's a specifically <laughs> Walpolean problem. But if, if you think, that the post of Lord High Treasurer is taken out of commission, and the first and second lords of the treasury then work very closely. The power of finance is fundamental to the power of the prime minister, and it is of absolute fundamental importance that the prime minister and the chancellor um, have the closest working relationship and I'm sure you've written about this, um, that if you look at the relationship between Margaret Thatcher and Geoffrey Howard to begin with, that went wrong after he ceased to be Chancellor, and with Nigel Lawson until the ERM problem. When those relationships were working well, the government did tremendous things. When the re relationship with Nigel Lawson finally broke down, then the government broke down, and the Brown-Blair experience likewise so the relationship between the first and second lords of the treasury is fundamental. The example that um, I, I kept reading um, in relation to the chancellor and the prime minister now is you want a relationship like that between Cameron and Osborne, which was excellent. But with that arrangement, you didn't need to merge number 10 at the treasury at the top. And the argument always is that you need... Um, uh, the Prime Minister to be able to propose. But ultimately, you need a kind of sort of backstop. You need the Treasury to be able to dispose and sometimes to say, I'd be a bit careful about that if I were you, Prime Minister, because um, we need to run the public finances in good order. Well, I'm, I'm sure that um, the, both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor want to um, have the public finances in good order. They're Conservatives. They believe in sound money. In which case, why is it necessary to merge the number 10 and the Treasury at the top? Well, because the advisors need to work closely together. It, it should be a very, very close relationship. I think it's a very sensible thing to do. Um, just finally, uh, we should not altogether abandon the subject which kept us occupied through so many happy hours last year, <laughs> namely Brexit. We're now on stage two of the talks. Do you think it's likely that at some point there will be a breakdown in the talks? Um, I think it's in everyone's interest for the talks to be successful. I think uh, Monday we've gone out with a team, according to the radio, of 100 people to begin the negotiations. There are important trade relationships uh, between the two countries, that, well, between the EU and the UK, that are in both sides' interests to maintain. Um, there will inevitably be various things that crop up along the way uh, as bargaining counters of greater or lesser importance. I, I don't know if you saw in the papers yesterday about the demand for Napoleon III's bones to go back to France um, uh, as part of the negotiations. So we may get some surprising things coming along. View number one is there's about to be a breakup because the two sides are so far apart. View two, well, it's great that they're far apart because we're asking for things that are ultimately compatible. We're not pretending any longer um, that we can have half a foot in and half a foot out, that we can have full access somehow without being members of the single market. So ultimately, everything will be all right. But we're asking for an off-the-peg arrangement similar to the ones given by the EU to other countries, um, Canada, Japan, whichever one you choose to pick, and not to have um, any form of special relationship. We want an ordinary trading relationship with the EU between sovereign equals. And on that um, happy note, um, uh, we will end uh, this week's Modcast. It's very good to see you again and I hope to see you in a fortnight, same time, same place. Thank you very much. Very touchingly, a number of people were saying to me, when was the Modcast coming back? So I'm very glad and that have, we are They back. have been saying it to me. But unfortunately, for one reason or other, it's been shrouded in mystery, but at long last we're able we're to tear the veil of the mystery aside and we're yes. back. And we're now off to wash our hands because that's the government advice. We're off to do that. The Modcast fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.